Hello, everyone, and welcome to Behind the Story here on Keystroke Medium. I'm Josh Hayes here with Scott Moon, and today we are talking with Stephen Moss, one of the 14 authors who contributed to the Explorations Through the Wormhole Anthology by Woodbridge Press. The Exploration series is a collection of themed short stories set in a shared universe where the authors were given a set of rules and technology and set loose to create or destroy however they saw fit. Stephen Moss, known for the Fear Saga, contributed personal growth to the anthology, and today we're going to talk to him about what inspired the story and what it was like to write in a shared universe. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, guys. Pleasure to be here. Hey, Stephen. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and your writing? Give us a little bit of uh, history on Stephen Moss. I, th I mean, I think like like a lot of authors coming up in the indie world today, um, and that sounds like we're like awesome rock and rollers, you yeah, know, we we're in the indie oh, we world. Are. Yeah, that's true. That's true fact. We are. Exactly. You yeah. know, I, I've, I've come from a non-writing background and I've gotten a chance to pursue the dream and all that good stuff. I, I, I'm not going to deny I'm, I've been excited to be able to go full time and, and, and really, really go after it and sing my teeth in. But, you know, I'm also at that stage where the the um, the sheen is starting to wear off and you start to realize, you know, the truths of having to manage all the business side of the stuff, which is. Oh, yeah. Different. Let's just leave it at that. The yeah. joys of Amazon, right? Yeah. Um, right. But yeah, so so I came from a big like consulting background. I was an IT guy, again, like a lot of us, I think. And uh, and now now I do this. Uh, now I get to say at parties, I'm an author, which I will, will not deny is is a spectacular. And then they look at you like, oh, you're one of those. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely, of course. And I made a rule I would never say it until I was making money doing it, and that would, I have to say it was a big, it was a big switch. So and they say something know, like, "I got a great idea for a book that you should write." Those guys, yeah, exactly, well, holding up the. I appreciate those, it. Yeah. Thank you very much. I also have a great idea for a book that I, I'm already writing. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're known for the Fear Saga. Um, mm. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. No, I mean, and the Fear Saga, I got to. Uh, I do something that had always been bugging me for years about when I saw kind of the first contact movies. Um, uh, and, and we were all very familiar with the, with the concept. Um, the thing that a lot of people get annoyed with is kind of the Deus, Deus Ex Machina ending where, oh, we found a way to fire a bullet through this spectacularly clever shield. Or Shield's if down. you fly a biplane up the juxy of the spaceships, uh, somehow that works, right. But right, yeah, right. And, and for always, that's frustrating. For me, it was more frustrating the fundamental concept that anyone that can get here from somewhere else, by definition, you know, we're done. If they, if they have ill intentions, you know, they're yeah. so far. Yeah. I use the, uh, the, the comparison to the arrival of the Portuguese and the Spanish uh, uh, during the, uh, you know, the high, high times of the, the Incans and the Aztecs. Um, and they had 150 guys against 10,000 highly trained Incan warriors. And they just have to have guns and sails. And that was really the only thing they had. Ten right. years before they landed, we were doing the Spanish Inquisition in Europe. It was not like we were more advanced, you know, <laughs> by yeah. right. for gunpowder. We were definitely medieval SOBs. But, um, you know, but that sm small advance was enough to give them a huge advantage. And the kind of technology gap we're talking about for someone who can come here would be vast. So so our, our living or dying depended purely upon, frankly, their state of mind. Um, and if they chose, they had ill intent that we were in trouble, but also that they would probably be just as complex a race as we were. So, yeah, that was really the whole basis for the book. I tried to think, what would that really look like? I didn't think it would be just a, um, you know, a single minded Nazi regime turning up. Right. Uh, you know, at the very least, even if there was a Nazi regime, I thought there'd be dissenters and I thought they'd be fighting against it. So I tried to flesh out what I thought this might look like. And I definitely anthropomorphize quite a lot. You know, there's. Right. That's been a, a comment on the books, but I didn't feel like trying to create an alien race that was so alien. Uh, I, I really wanted to try and say, what do we look at if we kind of met ourselves a hundred years from now and, and how things would transpire? And, and you know, it gets pretty ugly, uh, not surprisingly. I've read some books where they go so far into in, into originality that it's almost unreadable and it's not it's not that enjoyable. Um, yeah, so there's got to be a balance, one, you know. I want oh, I want yeah. I want to be able to get into the story without having to try to figure out their language because they only speaks in you know m dashes and or whatever. You know, well, we so. love to speculate and that's fabulous and we can speculate with grounding and that's the joy of science fiction. But when our speculation is based purely upon just guesswork. That that's edging into fantasy, and that it's sure. 
Now, and much as I love Jacob Cooper, and I really do, and I have to say he may be bending me back towards fantasy a little bit after a few years away from it. Uh, yeah. The truth is also I, I'm much more of a I don't like my science to be fiction and science fiction. You know right. what I mean? I like a real grounding there. Right, and I saw that in your in your profile there, um, your author profile on Amazon. That it's just some hard science fiction. People like uh, Orson Scott Card, um, Peter F. Hamilton, um, are some of the ones that are cited. So those are all excellent. I'm great um, for me. I, he's, he's, he stands right out there. Yeah, one yeah. of my first big science fiction books I really got into was Ender's Game, of course, like a lot of people of our generation. But spectacular stuff. It's good. It's literally has everything. You laugh, yeah. you cry, yeah. it's the whole thing. Good deal. So you write these first contact novels. This isn't the first anthology you, you've written for. Can you tell us a little bit about? And a couple of others on a much lower scale. You know, I, I frankly, you know, uh, when I was not uh, at this level, at the level playing with, with such great writers, and it was so really exciting. You know, as mm -hmm. I mentioned before the call when we were chatting, you know, uh, I had the opportunity to chat with Ralph a few times, and I'm a big fan of his. Uh, right. And of course, I've, I've uh, Jacob and I have been exchanging a bunch of emails, uh, picking on each other since we started writing on this too, mm. uh, which is great stuff. But uh, you know, I, the 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 level of this one I think is uh, is really exciting. I love the shared universe concept. It's not just the concept of anthologies in the past, and I, and I like it. Is just given a rough you know spectrum to work within uh, and just say and run with it. I like that we put a few. Uh, brackets on it so that we could still have a I mean there's a wild variation between these stories I, I've oh, yeah. I had the opportunity at this stage I haven't read them all but I've, I've read most and there is a there is a wild variation but still within those confines right. and that's just like the essence of science fiction you know, limit yourself to a set of solid realistic rules but then you know go hog wild you know, have some fun with it and, and that's uh, that's definitely what people did yeah. we've uh, we've blown a lot of stuff up it's been good times oh, i can't yeah. wait so, to read the uh, the rest of the stories that sounds yeah. awesome so talking about wild rules or rules within science fiction so what's your take on like world building because i guess world building is part of any any genre i mean yeah. so how do you how do you yeah now we stayed and, away from uh, for the most part we stayed away from from actual actually meeting other other cultures right in right, this in this right. set in the next set of books the next anthology we're working on within this universe the next aspirations mm -hmm. book we've already started nathan has already been posting around some things i actually worked on a prologue for something you know we've right. really said okay now we're going to go and meet other folks and see what that looks like and that's very much about world building so for the next one i'm really getting into um some interesting concepts of what about about what an alien world could really look like and to our conversation before about you know how anthropomorphic will i be yeah i'm, I'm going a little bit outside of the grain now i'm trying to say if i set myself a new set of rules what would that race look like so it's nothing to do with them coming here to meet us it's more to do with if i if i set a different premise for how, how life might evolve, then I just try, let's try and extrapolate all the details of that. And that's what I think is really important about world building. There's, a, there's an element, before you even think about writing anything down, you really have to just sit and just flesh and flesh and flesh out. And to, to the nth degree, I'll get into lengthy discussions. Uh, my poor wife has to get stuck with me uh, going into these things, not nearly as interested in this kind of thing as I am, <laughs> right. uh, but she each other. Yeah is admirable uh she'd much rather talk about the uh the election this year um and yeah, not well, some not many evenings i would too yeah but you know we, we we definitely get into uh, get into it in detail and then my father who was always a science fiction buff as well and got me into it too i'll try and break it down with him although he's um he's also an engineer so unfortunately he knows a lot more than i do so you know it's always dangerous talking to people like that oh, oh yeah engineers. they always ruin we've, it for everybody we've met a lot of extremely smart people on here that kind of put us in our our place a little bit intellectual <laughs> what you're a rocket scientist doctor um yeah Okay. Always tough. I have to say, there's the best reviews and the worst reviews when you get those online or you get emails from writers, from readers. Right. Those are like, "Hey, I'm a such and such at MIT." I'm like, "Oh, this is going well," and then they go, "Loved it, but," and then they go, "Just this little thing you did that basically clearly showed anyone who knew what they were doing that you didn't." Yeah. And uh, you know, so that's nice. But then they usually soften it with, "But hey, this was spot on, and yeah. you did this great, and you yeah. clearly read the white right Wikipedia page here." So congratulations. So yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's good stuff. Yay, Wikipedia. Awesome. Yeah, really. I, I I cannot fathom writing science fiction. I think you have to credit the past greats that much more when you think about, I know how much research I did building, you know, and, and analyzing the, the, not just the science behind a lot of the things I was doing from their perspective when I was writing the Fear Saga and writing this 
uh, these sh the short stories we're working on now, but also the, the 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 technology we're working with today at a military level, which factors a lot into yeah. writing. Mm -hmm. So you know, you don't want to run away too much when you're talking about how we're going to respond. Right. And, and I've got to say, how people did it before being able to jump online and see what French Rafale fighters uh, uh, do that's different from a British Typhoon fighter, which sounds like a silly thing, but God knows it's not freely available, and it right. would have taken years oh, in the yeah. library to get that kind of info. Oh, well, yeah. and that's that's the famous thing about uh, Tom Clancy, you know, is the fact that he did that research, and people thought he well, he obviously had to have been a submarine commander. Right. It's like, no, I just did my research, and people are like, can you even do that kind of research? Where do you find that? Yeah. Submarine yeah. commanders as well, of course. We don't. <laughs> <know>. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, and then there's Asimov, of course, which is, I mean, we're still today building our, our actual world around the ideas he had about where we would go in oh, terms absolutely. of the invention of the laws of robotics. I mean, those are baked into everything we're working on now. Even the, yeah. the term robotics, I mean, the guy found it so much. Yeah. So yeah, yeah what they were doing, for, they say there's nothing new. They were doing something new under the sun and it was, uh, yeah. it was really something different. So I always like to credit them. You wrote personal growth for explorations through the wormhole. Uh, well, I like before where you, you said it, Josh, you said Stephen contributed personal growth to the series, <laughs> which that's, you know, I did fame for that. I yeah, sat down, no, you know, I, talked, I had a couch and I had people write. Yeah. Everybody yeah. sat down and talked to Stephen about their deep, darkest exactly. secrets. Exactly. Some more than others, right? Exactly. I had to grow <laughs> no. uh, Yeah, no, I did uh, personal growth with my story. Uh, the, what I was really going for, I wanted to explore the concept of varying gravities and, and other writers have done it and they've done it very well but varying gravities and the concept of when we send ourselves out into the into the universe and into the ether that i, I think the idea that we're going to land on planets and walk around and in the form that we're currently in now we even just we look at exploring mars and and every science fiction writer that's ever touched on that will tell you that that within a generation of that we're going to look at vast changes in the human uh, uh, body vast change mm -hmm. in terms of lung capacity and changes in terms of musculature um and and skeletal build so uh, either deliberate or or just due to to um just due to who can survive there and who and who can't um, I think that as we look at sending people out into space, the other part I wanted to look at was there's a lot of, um, what's the term? When you're in space, there's a lot of vestigial stuff on the human body that you really not only don't need, but, but is a great hindrance. Uh, and mm -hmm. so when I wrote, I want to write what an economy spaceship would look like. So I wrote from one of the, uh, the, the time what I envisioned as one of the lesser economies of the world, getting a shot at one of the less, you know, um, uh, exciting looking wormholes. And the fact that they would not be sending up some spectacular starship with a cockpit and crew quarters and everything else. Right. They were basically just going to lop off any excess material off the human body. And they had a, 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 some biomass that they were going to grow from and say, OK, when we get there, we'll see what kind of bodies you need. And, you know, if right. you need four legs, we'll give you four legs. If you need yeah. to be six foot, we'll be six foot, you know. So, yeah. wow. And I really think that's a very likely as, as science proceeds in terms of the ability to travel. I think far faster science is proceeding in terms of the ability to affect the human body. And I think well, before, long before we see FTL and, and everything else, we're probably very likely to see things like advanced genetic modification and the ability to change you know, basic stuff like eye color and everything else, but also strength, um, uh, you know, oxygenation of blood, all the rest of it. And right. To be able to say I'm going to be a Sherpa one year and I'm going to be a, uh, uh, you know, a swimmer the next year and, and see what that looks like. Or, yeah. or yeah, I don't know, a cheetah the next day, whatever, whatever works best. Yeah, I definitely oh, agree with you. I think that that uh, genetics is going to far uh, far outweigh or uh, overcast uh, FTL or, or space exploration. Even though I think that's somewhere where we need to go, but I think genetics, and I'll, I think that um, actually um, the ocean is where we're going next. I would imagine, um, just because there's so much there that we haven't explored. Um, there's a great deal under the water. There's, there, there's so yeah. much of the planet we haven't we haven't seen yet, and certainly in terms of where can seven when we get to ten billion and fifteen billion and twenty billion people, there comes a point certainly where you say, well, let's look at the other two thirds of the planet and see right. if we can do yeah. something with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, I mean, that there's some more space, you know. <laughs> look at that. We got this uh, Atlantic Ocean here. Let's see what we can do with it. I saw a little video on how deep the ocean really is, and it's like a little graphic where it was dropping. And it just went. I was like, man, the ocean's really deep. It just keeps going. No, you could. There's, there's places right. you could take the take Everest and just flip it, and and it, okay. it would sink wholly. Yeah, it's it's 
It's deeper than the land yeah. is tall, yeah. In fact, interesting, talking about going off the side of a planet, one of the things, uh, the other things I enjoyed exploring in the Fear Saga, and I'm doing in the next short story for the next one, is the concept of, of virtual reality. And again, how, for going long distance in space, you know, rather than having to run on exercise machines all the rest of it, I think we'll let the body do that for us, and the mind, meanwhile, will be plugged into something else. And again, talking about technology that's going to move far faster than FTL, you know, virtual reality is five years out, ten years out. Yeah. Um, you know, already we're looking at computer games that are, they're distinguishable from reality, but the line's getting much, much harder to, I mean, it's, the, the, the latest Tom Clancy game, for example, it, it's astonishing. Yeah. You, you can very quickly forget that you're playing a game. You can very Absolutely. quickly absorb yourself a lot, into a it lot, a and lot. make that leap and suspend disbelief or whatever phrase you choose to use. Absolutely. And uh, I think that that will be the other thing as well in terms of long distance travel. If I've got to spend two years or 50 years in a spaceship, I'm going to spend that time doing whatever I like, you know, just free dreaming and doing very cool stuff, you know. And, and I think back on Earth, one of the great limiters to FDL and exploration might be that we end up as a race doing that more than we end up actually going out and getting stuff done, you know. Right. It's amazing yeah. how much a computer screen and a TV absorb our time already. And that's right. bad 2D in the corner of the room. Make it 3D <laughs> absorbing our Type yeah. and add touch and, I, and smell to it, and suddenly, yeah, it's not it's not four hours a day; it's it's twenty four hours a day. I, I could see that you spend like three hundred years in a cryo tank, semi dreaming with your video game, and you get to the planet finally through all this technology, and you look at the planet, and you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go that back to bed. Thanks. The opportunity to just totally yeah just jinx the whole thing just right the end like yeah. <laughs> oh man that, no, just, that'd be a know, great yeah, story okay. the whole build up <laughs> the whole build up like the, a whole novel you got 56 chapters of getting there chapter 57 you get there and you're like never mind let's go home yeah. <laughs> the whole book just ends. well that's the joy of anthologies you know you could do something slightly comedic with that and yeah. you know you have to let others know you're going to do it so that you know, heaven forbid, you know, because other people better take themselves real seriously if one of the writers is just totally, you know, trashing yeah. their opportunity. But yeah, maybe Probably, that is, yeah. a, say, a couple it's of, not always going to be glory, you know? Yeah, yeah, I definitely have a couple of hints. This is the story you're getting here. Well, you, you know, uh, <laughs> Pre-warned people. You There's going to be a multi, twist. You go all Monty <laughs> Python and the, uh, the Holy Grail with them. There's a whole huge buildup and you're like, yes, 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 yes. And then at the end, they just all walk away. And you're like, what do you mean they just all walked away and the movie yeah. ends? The Except the French. Life. The French stick around. At yeah. the end. They survive everything. Right? Well, yeah. they're the French. So can you tell us a little bit about how your writing process goes? Are you Do you plot out your, your stories, specifically the short stories? You come up with the idea and then just free write the, the thing? How does it work for you? <clears throat> to that, you know, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the dream version of what I try and do and then what actually happens. So, yeah, what I try and do is I, I try and build, instead of trying to very clearly lay out chapters, which I've just found I, it is not within me to do that, um, I don't enjoy writing like that. I don't enjoy writing those chapters afterwards. I feel too too constrained. Um, but what I try and do is very clearly say, this is roughly where, um, get, call it the Larry David method. Like, this is what I need to achieve at the end of this scene. You know, bar that, run with it. Do whatever you like. Right. And I let the characters, you know, go kind of hog wild. What I fa and I know roughly where the book's trying to go. I know always base it on the end goal. Know, know your, you know, your final plot point. Um, right. And then what I find happens is I, I actually sit down to write it and the characters have a tendency to, uh, to, to, to bust right through that and just go off and do whatever they like. And I think that that's fine. And I let them do that, you know, and, and I don't try and fight it because I, I think that feels forced. And, and occasionally you have to just beat them back and say, no, you, just, you can't shoot that guy. That doesn't work. That's, <laughs> no, that doesn't work. Yeah. But, but occasionally you, you do have to let it let him. Uh, one of the controversial plot points in in the the last book of the Fear Saga was that one of my lead characters gets marginalized. Let's leave it at that. And I really didn't think that was where it was going. And then that's just where the other characters how they reacted to how to what he did. And I'm like, yeah, that no one would stand for this anymore. So nice. so uh, that's what I found. People either loved it or hated it, which may be a great sign for a plot point. Sure. Uh, but it was a great example of the book writing itself, which which eventually it starts to do. Yeah. Yeah. So it's personal growth. Personal growth, I just, I already always knew that I, I wanted, and I don't want to give away too much, but I always knew that I wanted to, um, I don't want to use the right word here. Uh, denigrate is, is the word that's coming to, to, to mind, but I wanted to 
lesson, show how unspectacular and improvised uh, space travel has been so far, and I think will be in the future. I think we'll start moving forward. The Martian did it spectacularly. Uh, Andy Weird just knocked it out of the park, showing us that you know, no matter as technology progresses, you know, we get better and better at things. If you're on the fringe of technology, you, a shit's always going to break. There's nothing you can <laughs> right. do about it. That's true. That's true. It, it's just more complicated the things that break, and it's harder yeah. to fix them, and it requires greater leaps of imagination. And when you're out in space, suddenly you can't just jump in the water and swim away. You know, you're in much, much bigger trouble. Right. And uh, uh, that so that was definitely where I wanted to go. I wanted to uh, take the whole thing down a notch. Um, and and we, if we were going through wormholes, then fundamentally what we were doing was going completely into the unknown. So all they could really do was, you know, pack well and hope for the best. That that, yeah. that was there. So that was my mission, mission statement was, yeah, they sent some smart people. They sent a very smart computer to help them out. And they, yeah, and they crossed their fingers. Okay, Stephen, so where can readers find more about you and your work? Well, I'm, again, like many writers, I'm not great at maintaining my uh, my, my public uh, sphere. So Facebook, strangely, even though you can never find me there personally, you can definitely find me there professionally. I find it's a great way to connect with readers. Uh, mm -hmm. I do a website, thefearsaga.com. Uh, uh, so please check that out. And uh, yeah, I've got a couple of new projects coming out. So please look for those in the near future. But my the big thing on the horizon that I'm very excited about is definitely explorations. I think it's going to be fun stuff. This has been Explorations Through the Wormhole. For Scott Moon, I'm Josh Hayes, and we've been behind the story of Personal Growth by Stephen Moss. The Through the Wormhole anthology will be available September 2016 by Woodbridge Press. And if you like this interview and it intrigued you at all, go buy the anthology and read Personal Growth and several other stories that are in that anthology. Uh, thanks, Stephen, for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, guys.